Hello, everyone. Hello, welcome. Grab your Harborview egg salad sandwich <laughs> and chips, and come on in, sit down, and hear a wonderful talk. Um, we have a relatively new uh, person with us at Harborview, Dr. Flavia Consens. Uh, here, I asked her a year and a half, but she's rel relatively new, a year and a half. Um, and uh, I'm fortunate, and I see patients for her in consultation for the sleep clinic. And um, we had a, a little bit of a, uh, call it like it is, kind of a <laughs> disaster. Uh, and Flavia is so nice and has agreed to um, speak for us today. And she knows in return she has the whole psychiatry department who will sleep for her, who will speak for her sleep department. So let me introduce her. Dr. Flavia Consens graduated from medical school in Montevideo, Uruguay. She completed her neurology residency at Indiana University and her sleep medicine fellowship at the University of Michigan with Dr. Michael Aldrich. She is board certified in neurology and sleep medicine. She was associate director of the Sleep Disorder Center and the program director of the Sleep Medicine Fellowship at the University of Michigan, one of the largest sleep medicine training programs in the country. She has trained approximately 40 sleep medicine specialists from diverse training backgrounds. She was at the University of Michigan for 11 years. Currently, she is associate professor of neurology and has a joint appointment in the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine here at the university to develop programs on the interface between those two areas. Her research interest is in the area of how coexisting sleep disorders and <coughs> subjects with medical conditions affect outcomes. She has developed screening tools for sleep disorders and currently collaborates in screening for sleep apnea in patients scheduled for surgery and patients with chronic pain. She also has interest in overlap of medical and sleep conditions such as REM behavior disorders, restless leg syndrome, and narcolepsy. She has given multiple talks at national and international meetings. Publications include multiple peer-reviewed articles relating to her interest in sleep disorders. Dr. Consens. Thank you so much for the introduction and the invitation. It's um, my pleasure to be here. Um, and um, I kind of decided to start with a generic introduction of sleep disorders and try to gear it towards how it's more relevant for you because I'm sure you see a significant number of patients that uh, also have sleep disorders. So feel free to interrupt if you have any questions and uh, I'll try to clarify any ideas. So sleep disorders are very common. It's like one in three people suffer from insomnia, which is similar to depression, one in 30 from sleep apnea, which is similar to diabetes, and one in 3,000 suffer from narcolepsy, which is similar to MS. So for every patient that you see with MS, you should be seeing somebody with narcolepsy, somebody with depression, di with diabetes, somebody with sleep apnea, and as you can all know, that is not the case. And it's because sleep disorders are vastly underdiagnosed, and it's a relatively new specialty. So, um, about uh, the NIH estimates that 40 million Americans suffer from chronic disorders of sleep and wakefulness, and 95% of them are unidentified and undiagnosed. There are multiple consequences for excessive daytime sleepiness that have been a little bit more studied, and I'm going to talk more about sleepiness than insomnia in particular because there is a much a larger body of uh, publications in sleepiness than in insomnia. But we know that sleepiness has cost at um, individual devil that reduces personal effectiveness, leads with problems in concentration, memory, and mood, and has decreased performance. And the level of decreased performance is similar to that that when you're drinking alcohol at the minimal levels allowed by law. A society level, there's been uh, disasters such as Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, Challenger, both Alex and Valdez. Those are the ones that were officially attributed to errors in judgment induced by sleepiness or fatigue. And there are a large number of other disasters that are not uh, accounted for. 
at socioeconomic consequences is estimated at direct cost of 16 billion and indirect cost of 50 to 100 billion on accidents, litigation, property destruction, hospitalization, and debt. And with all these issues about the increased expenses of health care, having something that is potentially preventable or treatable who have a huge impact on public health as well. So the National Sleep Foundation, which is an organization that produces an annual poll, has a theme each year where they try to concentrate their questions. And uh, a few years ago, it was sleepiness on the job. Half of the people recognize that sleepiness on the job interferes with the amount of work that they get done. And 20% report making occasional or frequent work errors due to sleepiness. And uh, that is in seen in multiple other specialties, I guess all we, you're going to have another lecture later on and what we know and regular uh, and ACG made hours, being on call and everything else, but uh, one of the things that I want you to think is that probably being a physician is not totally different biologically in regards to sleepiness and tiredness than being any other profession. So they have a large body of evidence related to other professions, not as, well, as much in regards of medicine but it's a significant impact on uh, not be, being sleep deprived on your performance. Uh, we know that over 100,000 motor vehicle accidents annual are sleep related, and that mainly comes from data to two states in, the, in the, this country that only are the ones, the only two that report sleepiness as a cause of an accident. The majority of the states do not require sleepiness as a question, so we do not really know how many accidents actually the driver says, yeah, I fall asleep at the wheel. 40% of long-haul drivers report difficult to stay in alert during at least 20% of their drives, and 20% of them admit dose off at least 12 while driving over the last year. So the next time you get on a highway and you see all those big trucks, think about that. <laughs> so what is the sleep is definition of sleep? Well, it's a reversible behavioral state perceptual disengagement and from and unresponsible from the environment. So. It's a very complex amalgamophysiological and behavioral process. It is not a passive process. And like coma, it's physiological, recurring, and reversible. But one of the big things that we tend to think about it is, by definition, when you're sleeping, you don't have consciousness. You have this disengagement. And there are all these sleep disorders that are based in the fact that that ability to disengage is not there. But um, so um, that prompts one of the biggest issues in sleep histories is that the patient usually cannot give you the history because by definition they don't know what's happening. So the key of getting a, a sleep history is try to obtain a clinical history and in sleep medicine, some parallels with pediatrics, you always have to re recur to the bed partner, the parents, anybody that can provide you a history. For some diagnosis, it's key to get the history because, for example, insomnia and restless legs are clinical diagnosis. You don't need any sleep study or any test to tell you the patient has the diagnosis. And when you think, for example, about excessive daytime sleepiness, there's a long list of differential diagnosis. And in our society, insufficient sleep is the one of the most common culprits. Probably 1 to 10, we're all sleep deprived by definition. We sleep probably an hour and a half less than the few generations before when there was no electricity. So how do you get the history? BEARS is a good acronym. You figure out what the bedtime, the usual hours, if there is excessive daytime sleepiness or not, how many awakenings are through the night, uh, what is the regularity and duration of sleep, and if there is snoring. And um, you have to get to these questions because somebody will sell, tell you, oh, I sleep through the day, I'm so sleepy, but they're not sleeping at night. So is that because they have excessive daytime sleeping or just because their internal clock or the timing of their sleeping is not right? So um, there are multiple things that obtaining history, obtaining sleep diaries, getting history from partners is key uh, to be able for you to make a diagnosis. And always review the intake of other medications because there's a lot of patients that are using medications and they don't know that they can cause sleepiness or sleep deprivation or, or um, insomnia. And just by adjusting the medication, uh, the symptoms can improve significantly. So I'm going to go briefly go over some items in insomnia since I know uh, you do have a significant number of patients that compli complain of insomnia. Uh, in psychiatry, you're in a key uh, area to help facilitate patients being evaluated for sleep disorders because as part of your, all your intake questionnaires, you probably ask about sleep disorders. You ask if they're, how is their sleep. Um, but 
m that question, just per se, will not give you the diagnosis of what sleep disorder is, so you have to go further down. So the definition of insomnia is difficulty falling asleep, what we call sleep onset insomnia, frequent awakenings through the night, sleep maintenance, early morning awakenings, having non-restorative sleep, and you have to have a consequence. You cannot just say, I don't fall asleep, and I sleep a few hours, and they have no complaint. It has to be a complaint, and that's why they're not animal models of insomnia per se, because you have to have that complaint of insomnia. And that's why the insomnia lies behind in many other sleep disorders in regards to what is the research that is uh, being produced. Do have the definition of acute versus chronic. We require at least three nights per week for over a month to be chronic. And it is important just to ask uh, what kind of insomnia you have because it may be uh, there's med secondary too. Insomnia may be caused by other things that are easily treatable. For example, if you have difficulty falling asleep, that patient may have restless leg, which is easily treated and solve the problem with the sleep onset insomnia. Frequent awakenings at night, those are the patients that we tend to see, for example, with the sleep apnea, in particular with central sleep apnea, tend to be having frequent arousal through the night. The early morning awakenings in our society, we see very frequently of patients with depression that I'm sure you see here. It's not just enough for research to get the history uh, there's a, a other methodological problems, and it's like, for example, we all have what we call sleep misperception. So we don't have an organ that tells us how much we sleep. Some of us are better and estimated, so basically we say, this is the last thing I remember while I was awake, and this is the first thing I remember, and we make it up. And some of us are really, really good, accurate. I fell asleep at 12.10, and I woke up at 7.50, and you are on the spot or by a minute. And some people will say, well, I fell asleep at uh, 3 in the morning when they actually they were sleeping since 11. And there is this misperception. And 10% of normal subjects reaching stage 2, which is we usually consider stage 1, drowsy, light stages of sleep, stage 2, more consolidated. And 5% of reaching slow-wave sleep, which is pretty deep sleep, will report no falling asleep during a 45-nap period. Those are normal subjects. And 83% of insomniacs and 50% of normal subjects report being awake if awakened in the first spindle of the night, the minute they go into stage two sleep. So there is this, this discordance in between what the patients report and what sleep is, and that is variable, very variable from one subject to the other. So when you read all those papers, and try to analyze what they're doing. Well, they may be talking about different things when they're talking about subjective reports versus objective data in the sleep studies. And even something that looks like, oh, I cannot sleep through the night uh, because the patient doesn't know what's happening before or after can actually it trigger a separate complaint. And for example, it's not unusual that patients with narcolepsy that have interrupted sleep present to clinics saying, I cannot sleep, I have insomnia which in reality, they have a disorder of excessive daytime sleepiness. So what are the most common reasons why you have insomnia? Drugs is something that is uh, always have to look, and just uh, there's a large number of medications that individual patients uh, um, interrupt their sleep. Medical conditions, primary sleep disorders, environmental circadian rhythms, patients tend to be a night owl, and now it's in a morning shift, and he goes to bed earlier, but he cannot fall asleep. Uh, psychiatric disorders are very commonly associated with um, problems, and it's estimated that 80% of the patients with depression will have some complaint related with insomnia. It's much more frequent in patients with anxiety, PTSD, and OCD as well. And I'm going to mention briefly... Um, psychophysiological insomnia. I don't want to give a talk all on insomnia, and uh, there are multiple types of insomnia, but um, psychophysiological insomnia is the one that um, is a disorder of somatized tension and learned sleep-preventing associations <laughs> that result in a complaint of insomnia and associated decreased functioning. So you have to have the complaint that something is not right. And, but the patients, patients basically get into this vicious circle. And the most effective treatment for this is cognitive behavioral therapy, CBTI, and, um, in the long term. And uh, the most limited factor in this country to provide CBTI is the lack of a specialist that can provide it. So uh, that's a great area for all of you. If you're interested, residents, and there, you have, have a rotation available through your department that you, if you want to do CBTI as well. Um, so what are the man principle, the managements to treat uh, insomnia? Treat the underlying cause, and 
in a lot of patients, you can see medications, coffee. They don't think about drinking coffee or caffeinated beverages all evening as a problem. Uh, principles of sleep hygiene, and those are available anywhere. And if you just go through those principles of sleep hygiene, make sure the patients have regular hours, they have real expectations, they don't pretend that, oh, now I got a second job and I have a problem because I'm only sleeping four hours. Well, they always slept seven. So you have to set realistic expectations for that individual. There is a normal variation of the time that you need to sleep. On average, we say we require seven to eight hours of sleep, uh, but there are individual variations. And, uh, and you can do a lot of behavioral interventions. You can do a sleep restriction for those patients that have inefficient sleep. You can do stimulus control therapy, relaxation, biofeedback, multiple things that are very helpful. And if you need to use sedative hypnotics, it's better if you use it in combination with behavioral management. So. What we guide our management on insomnia is based on this NIH conference done in June 2005. As you can see, it's a long time ago, and we're still using those management that there's much more that needs to be done and explored. But um, there are only a few FDA medications to treat for, ins uh, for the treatment of insomnia. The benzodiazepine receptor agonist and the selective melatonin receptor agonist, and recently doxepine has an indication of a much lower dose of three and six milligrams uh, for insomnia. Everything else that you use is off-level, which is the vast majority of medications or things that are prescribed for sleep. So they're actually, they're not trials or minimal trials or trials with minimal recruited patients in all the other medications for sleep. So what are the general principles of prescribing hypnotics? You have a good relationship with the patient, and you start a new medication when the patient has not commitment the next morning, so you don't know what the metabolism of that patient is going to be. You instruct to take the medication 15 minutes before the desired time. Don't tell them at bedtime, because the patient is going to say, oh, I want to go to bed at 9, so I'm going to take it at 9, but they actually don't get to bed until midnight, and they say the pill doesn't work. And... Um, and the other thing is this 15 minutes or 30 minutes, you have to adjust it for the half-life of the drug. If you're given a medication to treat sleep mainness insomnia, the half-life is going to be longer. It's going to take longer to kick in. You start with a minimal effective dose. You tell them to skip if they drink alcohol. And mainly, you also want to make sure that they're not masking an untreated problem. And in our society, the most common problem is obstructive sleep apnea. It, because when you're given a hypnotic, you're given something that is going to further relax the muscle, that's going to blunt the arousals. And in a structural sleep apnea, the arousal is the survival response to be able to catch up with your air. So you don't want to be treating people with hypnotics if you think they have untreated sleep apnea. So there's not one hypnotic that is the best. You just have to memorize and know what is the half dose and do use it for the purpose that you are treating the patient. So if somebody tells you, that I'm not sleeping, and you prescribe, for example, uh, Solpidem Ambien, the half-life is gone in three hours. Even if you double or triple the dose, they're still going to have early morning awakenings or sleep maintenance insomnia because it's gone out of the system. So you have to adapt the medication that you're using for the type of insomnia for the half-life. But even if you look at that, for example, Temazepam has a half-life of 8 to 20 hours. So in one individual may work, but not in the other. In one individual may be perfect for their bedtime, eight hours. For the next one, it causes significant drowsiness. So you have to keep whatever table you're going to use of the half-life of these drugs, keep it in mind, keep it in your pocket, adjust it for the needs of the patient, and even that for that patient may not be adequate. So... Um, and the issue with this half-life is that, as you know, if you're given one dose and the half-life is eliminated in one day, that's good. You have a peak dose when you give it at nighttime, and then you're awake through the day. But if the half-life is longer than a day, you're just going to continue accumulating this medication, which is what happens with a lot of the over-the-counter medications, and patients keep you the, tell you that they're very drowsy. So the adverse events are common, amnesia, disinhibition, tolerance, dependence. They have distortion of the normal sleep. There's been reported a lot of parasomnia, sleepwalking, sleep talking, eating, especially with some of the medications like sulpidem, but it's actually not only in sulpidem. The FDA is doing a, a um, revision of all these kind of medications because they all can report sleepwalking, which is significant because the patients are not used to sleepwalk, they're not prepared, they don't have the safety measures to make sure they have the house lock or anything in a safe environment. 
They cause the daytime sedation as mainly that side effect is related to the half-life of the drug. And all cause rebound insomnia and anxiety. So if you stop it, whether you ha don't have the reason why you started having insomnia anymore, when you stop it, you're going to have rebound insomnia. And you have to prepare the patients for that because then they try to stop it and they have insomnia and they say, I'm not ready, I'm going to go again. And they keep taking forever and a medication that may not be needed anymore. Yes? Do you have a guideline about how long uh, they would need to take it before they, they would get rebound insomnia? Um, it's, no, it's, 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 uh, the question is if there's a guideline and for how long they need to take the medication before producing rebound insomnia. It's very variable. The longer you, ha you have been using it, the more chances you're going to have significant rebound insomnia. And for some patients, it's only three or four days. For some patients, maybe 10 days. And they will tell you, I didn't sleep for a week. And it's significant. It's, it's, even though they most likely are sleeping through them that week, the perception is that they're not sleeping, and it's very disturb, disturbing for the patients. And, uh, and the other thing is, as I say, the adverse events is masking an untreated problem while you're giving an hypnotic when in reality there was something else that should have been treated. So other treatments include the health food store, antidepressants, and over-the-counters. The health food store uh, is like... There are only a few designed clinical trials. There is an issue of contamination in the samples because you don't know where it's coming, so there may be chemicals and toxins in those pills as well. There is poor reporting of any of those adverse events, and it's estimated that only less of 10% of the serious events, events on health food store products are actually reported. And then if when you test them, they tend to be extracts of a natural product. And for example, in ginseng, if you take a pill, it could be 12% of one, the extra, or 328% in a different brand of the same pill. So actually, you're not taking the same dose when you switch from one bottle to the next. And that's the same case with melatonin. The three milligrams of melatonin could be three milligrams of a 10% or 10 milligrams of a 90% extra of melatonin. And also, the chances of finding a really bad adverse reaction, um, if you think that it's one in a thousand, for example, uh, a traditional healer would need to treat about 48,000 patients, 4,800 patients with that herb, which means that he will have to see one new patient work for a working day for about over 18 years to have a 95% chances of serving a reaction in more than one user. So chances are, if there are adverse events, they're not being reported. And not everything is bad about these dietary supplements, and this is a, as a randomized placebo-controlled trial, which is a very nice design trial. In the study they used um, consisted of two soft gelatins and the dietary supplement um, with humulus uh, lupulus. And uh, the main point of this is when you do these nice studies, in this study, for example, that you can see that you have a marked improvement in the quality of sleep whatsoever in both placebo, 62%, and active, 65%. So even if the drug may not be per se, the placebo effect is huge. And every one of these trials that you'll see have a huge placebo effect. So unless you do this randomized placebo control, all these herbal supplements are going to do great. Okay? But placebo effect is great. So what about SSRIs and SNRIs? Uh, in particular for insomnia or sleepiness, I can tell you that between 5 and 20% of the patients will say they cause insomnia or sleepiness, the same pill. Some <coughs> pills tend to be more associated with one or the other, but if a patient you're giving medicine SRI and is telling you, I cannot sleep, it's true. 5 to 20% will not be able to sleep, and 5 to 20% is they're very sleepy. So it's just a matter of changing the timing of the medication, and that will help the patient a lot. Um, with propion is the only one that has more side effects of causing insomnia, and it's also like around 5 to 20 percent. It doesn't cause excessive daytime sleepiness, but any of the other ones, most of the other ones will have both side effects. Um, Brupevia will also cause significant nightmares. So what about trastodone? Trastodone is the most commonly prescribed medication for insomnia in this country. It's always listed with the 10, number one, number one, 10 med prescription medications in the States. In the short term, it costs sedation, and there are a few studies that show that it improves sleep parameters. So you have a little bit of improvement in sleep latency, decrease in the wake after sleep onset, and things like that. It causes additional risk factors for priapism and could complicate serotonergic syndrome if you're taking any other medication. And it can cause arrhythmias in patients with pre-existing cardiac conduction system. 
But there are no studies that look at the long-term use of trazodone for the treatment of insomnia. So we don't know what happens after you do these studies for two weeks. And there's only two relatively short-term insomnia efficacy trials with trazodone in non-depressed patients, and those have non-demonstrated benefits in improving sleep. The vast majority of papers are patients with depression that you give trazodone, and those have some benefit. But if you're not depressed, it may not be the best medication. And then I'm going to have a brief minute of talking about this over-the-counter medications. And I like this uh, trial. This trial came, this paper came, I think, last year or the year before. And actually, it did pad, um, measurements on measuring diphenhydramine and one of the new over-the-counter medications that is supposed to not cross the blame barrier. So they show that diphenhydramine, and they measure the occupancy of the receptors in the brain. And they found that diphenhydramine was almost 45%, 50% occupancy 12 hours after taking the medications compared with the placebo or the other medications. So if you look at placebo, the receptors are gone 12 hours after taking the medication. If you took a look at the medications that are antihistamines are not supposed to cause drowsiness, they're still there, but not as significant. But half of the receptors were still occupied with the phenidromine 12 hours after you take it which is interesting. Now, if you ask the patients, are you still sleepy? They don't perceive they're sleepy, even though half of the receptors are occupied. When they ask them for analog rating scales, or be stand for sleepiness scales, where it's an instantaneous measure of your sleepiness, they will say that they're as sleepy as somebody is taking the non-drowsy medications. So this is, and again, part of, part of the issue that we have with this report, that the objective measures of sleepiness, so how much you sleep, is different how much you perceive you sleep. And the clear example is the patient that will come and feel a very high score on an airport sleepiness scale, tell you I'm very, very sleepy, and then, for example, do not fall asleep in an MSLT, a multiple sleep latency test. When you give him the chance to fall asleep, he cannot fall asleep. Or the opposite, they will say, oh, no, I'm awake, I don't have any problem falling asleep, but every time you sit him, he will fall asleep. And there's, no, there's not a direct connection between one and the other. So... Um, I'm going to move a little bit over the area of sleepiness. And uh, sleepiness is supposed to be thought as a physiological state or urge that you promote the onset of sleep and is reverse associated by obtaining adequate sleep. So you have this urge, you fall asleep, you wake up, and you're done. You have this sensation that you're uh, totally rested. It only happens for some people, not for everybody. Uh, and, and even if you have it, it's very difficult to diagnose. There's a lot of people that have denial. I mean, if there's all their life, uh, I have several patients that have narcolepsy, for example, and if you have narcolepsy, you have a higher chance of having disorders of excessive daytime sleepiness in the family. So everybody in their family always fall asleep, just uh, take naps, cat naps all through the day. They never finish a movie with everybody awake, and there's not an issue. It's like that's the way it goes. And um, there's also a huge level of misperception. And I have patients that the family brought them because they see them falling asleep at the red lights every time they drive, but the patient totally denies having a problem with the sleepiness. The other thing is when you have chronic conditions as sleep apnea, for example, you may have developed it over many, many years. On average, it will take 8 to 10 years for somebody to be diagnosed in a sleep lab with a sleep apnea. So your baseline of how sleep rested you can be is gone. They don't have that comparison. There are... Cultural differences in some societies, taking a nap in the middle of the day is totally acceptable, so it's harder to evaluate. Uh, the typical example in our society is the night shift worker. If you are a day shift worker and you fall asleep at your desk, you get demoted, you get reprimanded, and everything else. If you're a night shift worker, if you're a nurse in the ward, and you take your lunch break for a nap, is what everybody does. So it's not a problem. So there's a lot of variation. And there are multiple medical conditions that can cause excessive daytime sleepiness or fatigue, and for patients that have fatigue and sleepiness, it's almost impossible to differentiate it. But fatigue, we think of it more of a, you don't have the energy to do things. You don't feel like going. When you're sleepy, if you are sedentary, if you're given the chance to fall asleep, you'll fall asleep. So if you're just sitting in a chair, you're not falling asleep, you don't feel like doing things, it's most likely you're fatigued, not sleepiness. Sleepiness tends to be caused by primary sleep disorders in the majority. You can be fatigued for a million other things, hypothyroidism, anemia, depression, you name it. But sleepiness, if you think sleepiness, think of a primary underlying sleep disorder. So you make the diagnosis, try to differentiate it. There's 
decreases in performance of neurocognitive functions that you can actually measure. And, uh, but that even the performance, when you actually try to do research about this, can be altered. And uh, there's a nice study that, for example, put um, jet pilots uh, in a simulator, and they were sleep deprived for a day, and they have to hit the right targets and do the right thing, and they were having a lot of errors in multiple times. Uh, and the only intervention was sitting the supervisor in the back, and their performance improved. So even if you're sleep deprived, you can motivate yourself to do better, but that improvement is very mo is, is momentarily. You just you cannot maintain it. So when you have you're driving and you're falling asleep and you have a near accident, you will wake up, but you will doze off again after your level of alertness and the level of sympathetic discharge come down. So all those fluctuations make research in this area very, very difficult. And there's no a sign or a test or anything that will tell you if a patient is sleeping. You just have to ask and try to gather information. And the patient will tell you, no, I never fall asleep or anything, but I'm struggling all day. I have to get up on my chair. I even asked my work to give me a stand-up desk because if I sit, I will fall asleep. But they will not recognize that they have sleepiness. It also depends on your job. I have like a, a UPS or FedEx loader, so he's on his feet loading charge all day. He's not sleepy because he never sits, versus somebody that has a desk job will be much, she'll have more chances of coming to you to say, oh, I'm sleepy sooner. So what is the differential diagnosis of sleepiness? Insufficient sleep is one to 10, as I say. That's what we see mostly. The majority of patients don't come to a sleep disorder because nobody has that um, need or there's no culture for do that, but that's what the primary care will see, that they, or you may see if you ask, that the most common reason for Sleepiness is insufficient sleep. You can have several causes of idiopathic hypersomnance. You can have sleep apnea, which is very, very common in our uh, population. Periodic limb movement disorders, that your legs are keeping you awake. You have commonly circadian rhythm disorders. And normally, adolescents go to bed later at night, go to bed after midnight, not just because they want to aggravate the parents, it's because their internal clock tells them to do that. And now it's even worse because they are on the computer until the last minute before turning the light off, and light, direct light in the eyes is the most potent stimulant to keep you awake. So they are perseverating and putting their internal clock into later and later times. And all those people, all their people that are in nursing homes, they don't fall asleep at six just to aggravate all the people that have to then t take them to the beds and their bedrooms. It's just because they have an advanced sleep phase, and that's what, they, unless they push it with the bright light later in the evening, they're going to fall asleep earlier and earlier every day. There are multiple medical, psychiatric conditions, and multiple drugs that can mimic symptoms of sleepiness as well. So you can use a lot of scales. And they're all based on different things. How sleepy were you in the, in the last minute or the last few weeks? Or uh, give me a visual analog call. But that will only tell you how do you feel, which may be different um, than um, the... Um, oh. Sorry about that. Which may be different than what actually you have... Um, as a performance measure. And there are multiple performance measures that you can actually objectively measure. And a lot of the car manufacturers are putting into algorithms all these different measures to try to avoid, for example, alert when the, sleep, the driver is falling asleep. So the syndromes of sleepiness, when you see somebody sleepy, think of many things. Think of somebody not sleeping enough, think of all the circadian rhythms, medical conditions, psychiatric conditions, drugs, Primary disorders of sleepiness, narcolepsy, Klein 11, idiopathic CNS, and then the things that we actually see more frequently, which are PLMs and sleep apnea. And I'm going to talk a little bit about sleep apnea. It's the repeated episodes of upper airway closure during sleep. So basically, the only part of your airway is that can collapse is between the back of the throat, the back of the tongue, and the soft palate. And we may be one of the only um, beings that are able to do that, supposedly because we elaborated in our vocal cords and our phonation and have a, such an elongated box that most of the animals don't have it, which limits the ability to have animal models of sleep apnea. Actually, the English bulldogs are one of the few ones that meet that criteria. Uh, so, um, so when you have sleep apnea syndrome is when you have sleep apnea, you have the events during the night, and you also complain of sleepiness. So you have to have the sleepiness to have the syndrome. The classic adult symptoms have been described many, many years is loud disrupted snoring with snorting, gasping, choking, unrefreshing sleep, and excessive daytime sleepiness. And 
this is true for majority of men, and we know that um, women tend to have more subtle syndromes. They tend to present more with um, uh, morning fatigue, headaches, or irregular menstrual periods, or other things. And actually, there are studies that show that uh, if you look at women that present with these syndromes, they have much more chances of being diagnosed with other things, fibromyalgia, anything else except sleep apnea, than a man that presents with the classical symptoms. And women tend to be protected to be to have sleep apnea until they hit menopause. And the same as cardiovascular disease, when you hit menopause, it gets in the same slope. So, but even if you had the classic syndromes, and this is from the database in, in Michigan, like even if you have severe sleep apnea, only 30% of patients with severe sleep apnea say they have a major problem because of sleepiness. Only 20% they have a problem with driving. So even if you have severe sleep apnea, the severity of the sleep apnea and the severity of the symptoms do not correlate. So you may have very mild sleep apnea and severe sleepiness. You may have severe sleep apnea and don't complain of sleepiness at all or don't have it. So sleep apnea is very common. 67% of Americans, 18 million, estimated by NIH, it's supposed to be as, say, as common as diabetes. And actually, there are some studies uh, that, for example, if you have diabetes and you're obese, almost 95% of those will have sleep apnea. It's vastly underdiagnosed. And in a study in 1992, they did a survey of 10 million ICDS diagnoses. So you're supposed to find 100,000 cases in those charts, but only 73 charts had a diagnosis of sleep apnea. So the vast majority of patients are not diagnosed. And it's, it's better, but it's still not there. Um, we're doing uh, better in regards to diagnosing. So when you get the community st study, community-based study, so not just how many patients come to the sleep lab, adults between 30 and 60 years, 24% of men and 9% of women have an RDI over 5. RDI is Respiratory Disturbance Index or Apnea Hypopnea Index, AHI. is how many times you stop breathing per hour. And you consider up to 5 to be normal. Now, so it's, the breathing problem is very common in adults. Only 2 to 4% will complain of sleepiness. But if you look at certain specific populations, you can see that, for example, if you have stroke, your chances of having sleep apnea is 70 to 90%. If you have diabetes, it's 36%. If you have diabetes and obesity, it's 90%. If you have AFib, it's 50%. So basically, sleep apnea is strongly associated with anything that is in the metabolic syndrome. So every time you see a patient in the metabolic syndrome, the more items you add into that syndrome, the more chances it's going to have sleep apnea. And then there are other things, like for example, if you have nicturia, like 50% of those patients have chances of having sleep apnea because sleep apnea can cause nicturia as well. So what are the risk factors? Uh, red is more commonly seen in men, as I said. The incidence increases with age. The higher incidence is 40 to 60, and that's because we only have epidemiological studies that follow populations for the last 15 years. We still don't know what's happening after you turn 60. The next cohort is going to come up in the next few years. Uh, by the way, sleep apnea was diagnosed in 40 years ago, so there's nobody had an official diagnosis of sleep apnea. It was not described. So we don't know what happens with the second generation or what's going to happen when you turn 80. We don't have that data. We know the sleep apnea clusters within families, and there are genetic distributions of the chances of having sleep apnea. But basically, independent of all these phenotypes and genotypes, <laughs> if your parents have sleep apnea and your neck looks like your parents, you have good chances of having it. If you ask the patient to open their mouth and you have to go to a tongue depressor, chances are that airway is crowded and that you have good chances of having sleep apnea. Obesity is a predisposing factor. It's worsened by alcohol and sleeping pills, and that's something that you have to be concerned if you're prescribing muscle relaxants, narcotics, or hypnotics. And there are specific anatomic malformations. Anybody that's micrognatic, anybody that's going to make the airway narrow will be at risk. So we retain the history. You do a physical exam. Uh, an exit conference over 17 inches for men, 16 for women will put your risk. And then you do a sleep study, uh, to see if you have a sleep apnea or not. But there may be a variability even if you get a sleep study. So this is your crash course on how to read a sleep study. That's what we do in the sleep lab. So we put a lecture to see what stage of sleep you are. We put a lecture to see what your eyes are moving. And this is rapid eye movement sleep, a page of REM. You can see the rapid eye movements, a low EEG. And we measure your muscle activity, your heart, and we measure your breathing. So basically, we put a belt in your abdomen, a belt on your chest, and we want to see that you're breathing while you're taking a breath in and out. 
And if you have sleep apnea, what happens is the minute you fall asleep, you're still trying to breathe, and you're trying to breathe harder and harder because you're not getting any air through until you wake up and open your muscles. And usually you only wake up for enough time to catch up on your breath two or three times. So you don't remember that. And this happens, this is in a one minute, this is two minutes, this is 10 minutes, and this is the entire night. So this patient had an AHI RDI around 70. When you get those reports back, so that means that 70 times an hour is breaking, waking up, gasping for air. He said he sleeps fine, has no sleepiness, and everything else. So this is the, this, the sleep. As you see, it's all fragmented. But you can have individuals like this that have what we call like upper airway resistance syndrome or mild sleep apnea. They only have a few events, and they're still complaining of severe sleepiness. And as I said, the severity is not correlated with the symptoms. This is what the normal hypnogram should look, in where this is stage one, stage two, slow wave sleep, and the red is REM. So you have the majority of the slow wave sleep in the first half of the night, and the majority of the REM sleep in the half, second half of the night. So if somebody is treated for sleep apnea, for example, has sleep apnea worse in REM sleep, and only uses the CPAP the first half of the match, it's not doing much for their sleep apnea per se. So. In addition, now we have to worry in our population that is increasing their weight and the component of hypoventilation. Some of these patients really go down and spend significant amount of time in the night in the 70%, and we still don't know the consequences of adding those conditions. So when do we treat them? When we have symptoms or signs of sleep apnea, because it's demonstrated that you have at least seven-fold increased rates of motor vehicle accidents if you are sleepy. Uh, when you have moderate sleep apnea, because it may predict early mor mortality, we know the association with moderate and severe sleep apnea. Or if the patient has any health or cardiovascular status, the patient has diabetes, hypertension, anything, you treat the sleep apnea as well. But we, don't, we need further studies to validate who is being used to be treated or not. The compliance with the treatment is motivation. So the more you can get the patient motivated, the more compliant it's going to be. So you ask them for every other symptom that can be caused by sleep apnea, mood disturbances, irritability, memory problems, impotence, reduced libido, morning headaches, nycturia, nighttime sweating, GERD, anything. And then when the patients come back and they don't have any of those symptoms anymore, you try to emphasize the fact that those is helping on something. And if those they have no symptoms, then educate the patient. There are multiple websites available to edu for education, and you can give them information. There are motor vehicle accidents, job impairment. We know that it has cognitive and neurofunctional, psychological function determined. We know by large studies that improves quality of life and that reduce hospital admissions and health costs. And the health and the cost of the sleep study is outside in the first year of cost saving. Patients with entreated sleep apnea have many more frequent visits to physicians and to hospitals over until they get treated. So, um, in conclusion, uh, sleep disorders are common, serious treatable and underdiagnosed. Take your patients or your patient's relatives. If you, they're with you in the room, you have a great opportunity into knowing what sleep is going on in that uh, bedroom. Complaints, uh, take their complaints on seriously. And untreated sleep apnea has increased morbidity and mortality. And education on the balance of benefits versus side effects is essential to get the patients to be compliant with all the treatments. And I will stop here so I'll have a few minutes for questions. Yes. Um, when you're talking about uh, those Benadryl studies, or the dimethyltryptamine studies, uh -huh. where, where uh -huh. all the receptors seem to be covered, even though the patient wasn't subjectively tired, do you, were there any functional tests done to see whether, even though the patient didn't feel tired, they were still cognitively impaired because of the? Yeah. In in that uh, particular study, they didn't do any study, but. A lot of the research in, um, so, so the question was like if there was any testing, specific testing in the function in the study with the dephenylhydramine uh, to see if there's a correlation with the level of occupancy in the brain versus the performance. And um, first of all, I think it was a good study because it actually showed that the brain can function in a different level than what the blood levels are. Because usually we just do assu go assuming that whatever your blood level is, is the level of your drug. And there is a discordance there to start with. Your blood levels tend to go down 12 hours after the half-life of the drug, for example. And, but your brain occupancy receptors may still be there. And the perception, in that study they didn't do that. Uh, but there are studies in where they show that there is not a clear correlation between um, the 
there's definitely not a correlation between the perception and your um, and your ability to function. The more, and there are very good studies in sleep deprivation. The more sleep deprived you are, and probably plateaus after six hours of sleep deprivation per night, the less you're able to assess your own function. So if you're sleep deprived, you don't perceive you're not functioning. You believe that you are functioning at a normal level. Yes. So the question was on oral appliances for the treatment for sleep apnea. And uh, uh, oral appliances are a good effective treatment, and they also have been shown in studies that decrease the blood pressure when you use them, but it's only for patients with mild sleep apnea, those that are between 0 and 15 events per hour. So there's a limited number of patients that actually can use them. And um, there are like 40 FDA-approved oral appliances. They're always coming up with new. Um, my recommendation in all my patients is if you're going to do an oral appliance, and a lot of my patients, for example, they go camping or something and they have an oral appliance when they travel and they use the CPAP at home because even when they use the oral appliance, they don't feel as rested or as good as the CPAP. Uh, and um, I would recommend the adjustable ones. And the adjustable oral appliance is basically, uh, there are several, basically they have like a way of turning the degree of advancement. The oral appliance will force your lower jaw forward. Instead of the normal body, it will force your lower jaw forward. The further you put your um, lower jaw forward, the more space you're going to do by taking the base of the tongue out of the airway and stretching your soft palate. So the further you can advance, theoretically, the more, the best treated you're going to get your sleep apnea. So I usually recommend for patients to have an oral appliance made that is adjustable so you can try to push yourself as far as you can so you get rid of the snoring, and that's one of the go symptomatic goals, get of the sleepiness, get of the symptoms, and uh, that you can tolerate because the further you stretch, the more problems you're going to have with the TMJ. So the patient is a point there that will have to stop because it's very uncomfortable. So, and then the maximum you can advance, then we like to retest them because you want to make sure not only they're not snoring, but, or they're stretching the TMJ for a reason because you're treating the sleep apnea. It may be working or not. Yes. <laughs> So uh, the question was uh, twofold. The first in regards to compliance, and the rate of compliance is uh, variable. And a lot of the data that we have, and actually, now that I'm thinking, I didn't show some of the slides, but um, the compliance is variable. It comes from older studies. When you select the patients that are going to be compliant, 75, 80, or 90 percent of the patients are going to be compliant for 13, 15, 20 years. The, so the overall compliance rate for CPAP is about 50%, which is the same as compliance for antihypertensive. So it's not unusual that half of the people take medication as prescribed, and it's not unusual that half of the people use the CPAP as prescribed. The ones that find results, that they have the right motivation, they stick with it for long, long times. Now, the compliant data is old from older studies, and we did have, like, much more bulkier, bigger mask, and no humidifiers. Now we have, like, different kinds of machines that give you different pressures, adjust, and humidity. And so the newer machines are probably better in regards to compliance because they um, they're able to adjust better to individual needs. There are many more masks that adjust better to the individual face anatomy. and So we don't know, but, but when the patients are compliant, they stick with it. Yeah. So, so the other question is, if they, that is not enough, is there a sleep medication? The vast majority of patients that are 100% compliant get resolution of the symptoms. And if they don't have resolution of the symptoms, it may be because the CPAP or sample is under titrating the patient. The patient is not at the right pressure. Or he was at the right pressure when they did the study, and now he gained 40 pounds, and the pressure that he's getting is not enough. So the big number one thing is to make sure that he's at the right pressure, the right mask, and things like that. There is a subgroup of patients that have residual sleepiness in spite of being 100% compliant. 
And there's only one FDA-approved medication for that, which is uh, Provigil, and they did a nice trial to show that patients do improve uh, their sleepiness. Yes. So the question is to address some of the um, less common problems with insomnia, the um, sleep maintenance insomnia and early morning insomnia. And, uh, we, um, we see at, in a tertiary center, we tend to see a significant number of patients that have insomnia due to medical conditions. And that is something that you always have to keep in mind. There's a large number of patients that, for example, we diagnose with central apnea. They don't have the typical snoring. They wake up all night long. The spouses see them making pauses, but they're just central apnea. And for example, they have undiagnosed heart failure, or they may have CNS lesions or something like that. Uh, drugs can do that as well. In our population, it's growing and growing more the percentage of people that are on narcotics and they have frequent central apnea throughout the now due to narcotic medication use. Uh, so, but there are multiple causes, and in, in general, as a rule of thumb, the, the longer they've been training themselves to, for example, I have a patient that I saw last week, oh, I always wake up at three or four in the morning, and then I stay awake for a day, and then for an hour, and then I go back to sleep. Well, they have been doing that for 30 years, and that's a routine that she actually likes, uh, that she gets her own time by herself in the house, and nobody's there, and she can do all her stuff, and, and so uh, she came because they, Physicians were saying that she probably needed to have a better sleep routine, but she actually didn't want to change the schedule. So the longer you're stuck with changing your clock, if you're, uh, for example, if you always wear a night owl and you always went to bed at 2, have a <laughs> night shift, and now and suddenly you say, well, I want to go to bed at 9 p.m. and wake up at 5, well, it's going to be very hard. The more entrained you are in your cycles, it's hard to change. So number one, if you're on early morning awakening because you always wake up early, just out of the sudden change it because now there's a night show that you want to watch, it's gonna be hard. And you have to put a lot of effort and you have to put with the patient, what are the goals, what is realistic, what is not. And, um, but as I say, there are multiple medical conditions that can cause that. And the early morning awakenings in our society, by large, when it's new onset, we see it in patients with depression. Yes. Um, the question was guidelines in regards of if you think the diagnosis of sleep apnea not to indicate uh, certain medications. Well, um, we, uh, the vast majority of patients that you're going to see um, are undiagnosed. The vast majority of patients with sleep apnea are undiagnosed. So that's basically the big concerns. Once you're diagnosed and you're in CPAP, doesn't matter if you take an hypnotic or not because you don't have to wake up to catch up on your breathing. So once you're treated, it's not a concern. And if you're going to have somebody in long-term hypnotics, long-term muscle relaxants, long-term narcotics, that's something that you should make sure that you get the patient at least evaluated. Now, uh, if you have to get somebody treated, uh, we don't know. There's a lot of under um, reporting of what will be a casualty of death. There is this big concern, as you heard, for example, from uh, the use of narcotics in patients in chronic pain, and I think there were like 6,000 deaths in the state or something over the last few years. Some of them is thought that it is because the patients have an underlying undiagnosed sleep apnea, and when you give them narcotics or hypnotics, uh, the combination of those two overcomes the arousal mechanisms and the patients are not able to wake up because a lot of these patients are found dead after and during the night. And actually, the distribution of death, uh, this is uh, on the side, the distribution of death, the majority of us will die during the early morning hours. That's the peak of the cardiovascular death. But if you look at the patients that have sleep apnea, the peak of the death occurred during sleep. So many years ago, we used to say, oh, well, you're not going to die during sleep. You're just going to have hypertension, heart disease. And, <laughs> but, but now we know actually patients with sleep apnea die more frequently during sleep than any other patient. Any other, uh, patient. So uh, it is a big concern you, when you give all these medications. Now, how, how big concern is? We don't know because there are not systematic studies that have done that. Patients are not screened for sleep apnea. And we, and we generally won't be able to get them. You can... Well, no, you can get a sleep study in this. Uh, you can request a sleep study, and you can uh, have them evaluated. Yeah. Claudia, thank you so much. It looks like the audience doesn't want to leave. <laughs>
<laughs> Thanks. Yeah, please let me know. I'll be happy to. Thank you so much.